I want to welcome you back to the second part of the Voting Rights Act at age 40. The panel discussion is continuing and is now in progress. And I'm going to turn next to Commissioner Kellner. Um, Wade mentioned the whole issue of states' rights, and we know that the Constitution leaves to the states the time, place, and manner of elections. So we'll let you talk about elections from there. Thank you, Sonia, and thank you, Wade, uh, for an excellent presentation. Actually, the Constitution says Congress has the power to regulate the time, place, and manner of federal elections. And, of course, that has been uh, the interesting issue that's come up now because of the Help America Vote Act. And perhaps what I should do is just start off quickly by expanding on what uh, uh, Mr. Henderson has just explained, which is that... Uh, Really, there are five key federal provisions that uh, affect me, at least at, at working at the Board of Elections, in terms of administration of elections in New York City. Um, uh, Wade talked about three of them, which are specifically covered in the Voting Rights Act. Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which bans any uh, voting practice or procedure that has a discriminatory effect on a protected minority group. Uh, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, which is by far the most significant uh, in terms of our considerations on regular operations, which requires preclearance of any change in voting practice or procedure. That means if we move a poll site across the street, we have to submit an application to Washington asking for permission to move the poll site. Um, by far the most costly uh, provision is Section 203, which is the language rights provision. And uh, 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 it has a cost, but I think it also has tremendous benefits, and uh, we'll talk about that. Then there have been two pieces of subsequent federal legislation that have occurred in the last decade. The National Voting Rights Act, which a lot of people called the Motor Voter Law, which uh, imposed on the states uh, certain requirements to make it easier to register to vote. Uh, and then, most recently, the 2002 Help America Vote Act, which now has New York in the throes of compliance. New York, out of the 54 covered jurisdictions, New York is in dead last place in terms of coming into compliance with that. And I'd like to talk about that uh, uh, when we get to that. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Section 5, and, and it probably helps to have a little bit of historical perspective on each of these, uh, but uh, Section 5 is the preclearance provision. Wade mentioned how uh, in the 1964 Public Accommodations Act, uh, the segregationists in Congress, uh, half-jokingly, half-designed to uh, make the bill untenable, uh, proposed an amendment to the bill to include sexual discrimination as one of the prohibited practices. And I remember as a lawyer uh, trying to uh, track down the legislative history of uh, the sexual harassment provisions, went back and read the congressional record on this, and truly the segregationist bloc in Congress th thought this was the funniest thing that they could do to add this provision to the Civil Rights Act to say, well, Let's make it apply to women as well as uh, on the basis of race or uh, creed or national origin. And uh, uh, the segregationists teaming up with the far left and the labor advocates actually uh, got enough votes to barely carry it in the House of Representatives. But everybody thought for sure it will die when it reaches the Senate, and lo and behold, the Senate passed it. And without any positive legislative history with any good reasons, on why it should be in the bill, uh, uh, sexual discrimination became prohibited. Um, one would think after learning that lesson that they would know better, but in 1968, when it came time to amend the uh, Voting Rights Act of 1965 to put some teeth to it, uh, and the preclearance provisions were added, again, those seeking to defeat the bill thought, hey, we got a great idea will embarrass Senator Kennedy, who was then the senator from New York, by making this bill apply to New York and other jurisdictions outside of the South uh, that have certain practices that they complain about in the South. Well, to 
the segregationist shock, Robert Kennedy got up and said, you know, that's a great idea. There's no reason this bill shouldn't apply to New York. And what happened in New York? There were two key provisions that then became illegal in New York. One was that uh, immediately prohibited New York's literacy tests. Now, New York's literacy tests were a great holdover of uh, Tammany's control over voter registration. Why do I say Tammany's control? I really mean the organization, because it's the organization that named the people who did the literacy tests. If you went to your local clubhouse, you could take the literacy test. In fact, they'd show it to you before you took the test so that anyone who went through the clubhouse had no problem passing the test. But if you didn't go through the clubhouse, you had to take the test on its merits. And uh, surprising how many people failed the test, even uh, 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 people with uh, college educations. Um, uh, what was one of the key problems or why they wanted to keep the test? Well, it was to keep Puerto Ricans from voting. Puerto Ricans were US citizens. You had a very substantial and continually growing Puerto Rican minority in New York uh, City at the time. And indeed, the Puerto Rican neighborhoods just happened to be bases of key leaders, uh, both in uh, Tammany Hall in Manhattan, uh, as well as leaders in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. And so uh, uh, they, of course, did not want to see the, this new group of people moving into their neighborhood suddenly gain political power. And so there was a lot of resistance to bringing Puerto Rican voters into the fold. Uh, so eliminating the literacy test was a major step forward in New York uh, to bring Puerto Rican vote, to give voting rights to Puerto Ricans. And of course, that was greatly enhanced with Section 203, the language minority uh, provisions that uh, uh, beginning in 1975 required New York to print ballots in Spanish as well as in English. And then subsequently, uh, when that section was amended, uh, New York has had to add uh, ballots for Chinese and Korean voters. And uh, indeed, uh, we came very close, uh, but not quite to the threshold of requiring ballots also in Russian and in Urdu. Um, the, uh, 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 New York has a long way to go, uh, however, because basically, uh, the attitude of most election administrators is to do the barest minimal compliance with the federal law. And uh, one of the things, particularly with language minorities, is that uh, New York could do much more if there were the will to do it. We could be providing voter registration forms in many different languages. And indeed, with the advent of uh, uh, electronic voting machines, if that ever happens in New York, uh, it would be relatively easy to uh, provide ballots for uh, multiple languages in addition to the four that are already required. Uh, that sort of segues into the Help America Vote Act. The uh, Help America Vote Act uh, was adopted uh, by Congress in 2002 as a response to the problems that were uh, finally illuminated in the public's eye, although election administrators and politicians have known about them for decades that were illustrated uh, in uh, Bush v. Gore and the problems that arose in that election. Um, the Help America <coughs> Vote Act, though, is a warning as to what can happen if people of good faith are not carefully watching what goes on. Uh, uh, the Help America Vote Act has four key provisions. One is that uh, Congress set voting system standards. There are about two dozen standards that are set in the uh, Help America Vote Act, New York's current system of lever voting machines complies with 23 of those 24 standards. The one standard that it doesn't comply with is the requirement that at every poll site there be at least one voting system that is fully accessible to the disabled, including visually impaired voters, um, who are, uh, must be able to vote on that system independently and without assistance. Uh, uh, all of the great thinkers within New York have uh, 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 thought and thought that they have not figured out a way to make a lever voting machine fully accessible to a visually impaired voter. And so as a consequence, 
uh, New York uh, will have to either replace its lever voting machines or at least supplement them with a voting system that is fully accessible to disabled voters. And that uh, requirement goes into effect on January 1st, 2006. Uh, a, a second aspect of the uh, uh, Help America Vote Act is a requirement uh, to uh, beef up voter identification requirements. Indeed, it was these provisions that led uh, uh, Senators Clinton and Schumer to be the only two members of the U.S. Senate to vote against the bill. Um, the provisions uh, are kind of silly if you go through the details of it. Uh, they require that uh, every voter who registers, every first-time voter who registers by mail uh, must provide uh, 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 either the last four digits of their social security number or their driver's license number or some other form of government identification to register to vote. Um, if they don't do that, and of, of course it only applies to persons who register by mail, if you register on the street uh, in a mass uh, registration drive but the registration forms are physically brought to the Board of Elections rather than mailed, the provisions don't apply. Um, the, uh, and then furthermore, if you don't provide the identification, at least under current uh, state of the law, um, you're given an affidavit ballot or a provisional ballot, and unless there's a challenge to that provisional ballot, the vote counts anyway. So they've created this whole relatively meaningless bureaucracy. But you see what happens when there's bureaucracy, particularly in New York with uh, um, a relatively low commitment on the part of the government to fund vote election administration, and I don't really quarrel with that. I don't particularly want to see my tax dollars being spent on election administration, at least unnecessarily, when they could be going to schools and transportation and all of the other uh, uh, much more, in my view, much more pressing public issues that we have. But uh, the result is, is that uh, almost everybody in New York who gets snagged by the voter identification provisions are snagged because of administrative mistakes by election officials as opposed to failure to comply with the substantive identification requirements. So that, for example, out of the uh, 40,000 voters last year who did not provide identification with their mail-in registration forms. Uh, the Board of Elections then did follow up in trying to get those, uh, that identification before the election. Uh, and uh, some 2,000 voters were ultimately rejected because of bad identification. When we actually did a study of why the identification was, it wrong, was wrong, was it because of fraud or was it because of administrative error, we found that in virtually every case, it was because of a typographical error of inputting the identification information. So that's a scary part of, uh, of that provision. Um, a third part of the Help America Vote Act was the requirement that there be provisional ballots. That's been a provision in place in New York for more than 20 years and uh, has been uh, fairly successful in New York. But as uh, the most recent uh, election for state senate in Westchester revealed, uh, there still can be difficulties in administering the fine points, particularly, again, when election officials are responsible for the mistakes in the administration, which was uh, the real source of uh, that litigation which uh, tied up that state senate election for uh, uh, nearly three months and uh, uh, ultimately uh, resulted in a ruling by our highest court to count the ballots uh, that were... Uh, uh, erroneous, that had errors on them because of uh, election officials' errors. Uh, uh, even though those ballots were counted, it ultimately did not change the outcome, but at least New York took a good rule on this. But throughout the country, this has been a new source of litigation and confusion uh, in terms of how you go about counting provisional ballots. And then the last part of the uh, Help America Vote Act was to create a voting machine uh, or a, a fund for replacing lever voting machines and punch card voting systems in those states which uh, had them. Uh, of course, New York uh, does qualify for the uh, lever voting machine replacement funds. New York gets $65 million in funding 
for uh, lever voting machine replacement. The, um, uh, in addition, uh, all states have general funds uh, available to comply for, uh, with the Help America Vote Act. New York's share of those general funds are $135 million. If New York does not replace its lever voting machines, it will lose, by uh, January of 2006, it will lose that $65 million in federal funding. Um, uh, a lot of the press reports talk about also losing the $135 million. That is unlikely, in my view, based on the language of the bill. What's happening in Albany? The legislature is completely tied up in knots on what to do with this. The uh, legislature has... Uh, not decided what they want to do. Uh, both the Senate and Assembly have passed uh, substantially divergent bills uh, on the subject. There's a real possibility that uh, New York will not have any legislation at all and that it'll, a federal judge will ultimately uh, decide how New York will be brought into compliance uh, with the new voting machine standard requirements in the Help America Vote Act. Certainly, I think that the time in which the legislature could act has already passed. That uh, if the legislature were to vote tomorrow a bill implementing a new voting machine, a, a new voting system, and I'd love to talk about some of those alternatives that they're debating, but we don't have enough time to do it now, it's still too late that there's no realistic way that the New York City Board of Elections could implement any legislation that's passed in Albany at this time in time for the uh, 2006 elections. Um, bottom line on all of this is that uh, uh, the uh, um, Voting Rights Act um, has had a very positive effect in New York. The cost of compliance is relatively little for the benefits that uh, uh, minorities and all New Yorkers have gained as a result of that and certainly needs to be uh, extended. However, our lessons from the Help America Vote Act are that Congress can really screw it up if they change it and don't do it right. And right now, with the current complexion of Congress, that's a scary thought to me. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Devo Adegbele, please. It's, uh, it's great to be here with all of you this, this evening, and um, like some of my predecessors, I too have a debt to our host family. Marianne Lotto was one of my predecessors at LDF uh, at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. So um, our tradition is in part her tradition, and I thank the family for sponsoring this event. Um, the more things change, the more they stay the same. I think that is actually the way that I like to frame discussions of where we are at, at the uh, 40th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act. There are um, a number of ways to look at the issues that are before us, but the way that I choose to do it is really to think about the issues in terms of two, um, two stories. There are two stories that we have to be telling. Arguably, there are more than that, but for simplification purposes, I like to think of it in terms of two stories. And I should dispose of one preliminary, and that is that I have had the, um, the good fortune of being the person closest to the podium, so it's been my responsibility to sort of pass the your time is almost up note. And uh, <laughs> because I'm not as disciplined as my predecessors, I, I didn't pass it back this time. I just left it there because I, I tend to go on, so I'm going to keep thinking that I, I have two minutes to go and we'll, we'll see if I can get through. Um, I, I want to pick up on some of the things Nina shared because I think they're very important. When she told the story, the recent story of the elected official who had to face violence and threats um, outside her house, um, I quickly had to sort of rework my outline because I, I, w I was intending to conclude with a story that now I will move up because I think it will put a frame on the two stories of the VRA. Nina told a recent story uh, from Mexico about the intimidation that minority candidates and people who uh, want to advocate on behalf of minority citizens face. So. I will start with a story that Judge A. Lee, Leon Higginbotham, my mentor with whom I worked at Paul Weiss, uh, a story that he shared with me about a trip that he took to Mississippi on the occasion of the 4th of July, shortly after he had been um, confirmed as a federal judge. 
This was in the 1960s before passage of the Voting Rights Act. And he went down to Mississippi to speak about uh, what our nation is all about at the occasion of our nation's birth. And uh, Judge Higginbotham was advised by friends and family, well, at least by friends, I, I think his family knew better, uh, to not travel to Mississippi at that stage as a recently confirmed federal judge. He was the fifth African American ever to hold that prestigious position. He was advised not to go to Mississippi because, of course, it was too dangerous. And the judge said that if he couldn't go as a federal judge to speak about the principles that he had sworn to uphold, then he was not entitled to occupy his seat on the bench. So go he did. And his host in Mississippi was Vernon Damer. Uh, many of you may know of Vernon Damer. Vernon Damer was the local head of an NAACP branch in Mississippi. And uh, he had the good fortune to have achieved a, a certain amount of uh, financial stability. He was a, a uh, self-employed businessman. He had a store. He did very well. But Vernon Damer was a crusader for voters' rights. He was a crusader for registering voters and for pushing against the Jim Crow system. Vernon Damer, when he drove Judge Higginbotham around Mississippi for the various meetings and discussions, would um, let, let the judge out, and then he would take a spool of thread, a spool of invisible thread that he had, and he would take the thread and sort of rig the car with this invisible thread. And, you know, he did it once, and the judge sort of looked, and then he did it a second time, and the judge decided to inquire of Mr. Damer what, what it was that, that he was doing. And he explained to the judge that it was important to do that because that way he would know if the thread had broken that during the time they, they were away from the vehicle, somebody had been at the vehicle and there was danger that they needed to avoid. And the judge shared with me that message. Of course, the judge gave the speech and it went off without a hitch, but Vernon Damer's story is the same story that Nina told about her um, client in, in Texas because, of course, the Klan came to Vernon Damer's house not too long after that. And they came with the same lights, and they came with the pickup trucks, and they came with their weapons, and they um, lit the house on fire. And Vernon Damer, uh, like the person we heard about, went to get his shotgun to defend his family and his property. And he returned fire. He, sh he shot out the window so that his family could have time to escape out of the back door, and escape they did. But Vernon Damer was bad badly burned on the occasion of this Klan attack on his home because he dared to stand up to the power structure, and he later died of those injuries. And not too long ago, one of my colleagues from our communications department did me a great favor. She, she was in Mississippi on a different matter, and she traveled to the site of Vernon Damer's um, grave, where she took a picture for us of Vernon Damer's tombstone, which reads simply, if you don't vote, you don't count. And I begin with that story because I think it puts a frame on the extent to which we are, in fact, dealing with two stories. We're dealing with a history that is somewhat distant to some and a history that is very real and not so distant to others. And as we look toward the issues and face the issues that we're presented with at this juncture, it's very important to recognize all of the progress, to recognize the extent to which minority voters are registered and vote, the, to recognize the extent to which legislatures on the national Congress and, and local legislatures have become diversified because of this very powerful and effective act, but we also have to recognize that some of the forces, some of the pressures that minority voters and citizens have faced exist today in, in much the same way, perhaps not exactly the same way, although in some cases the, the stories, as we know, are, are, are very much the same. Um, so I want to move on now with telling two stories, and there's one more piece of history, but for this piece of history, we go only back as far as last month. Last month, I had the good fortune to be in Selma, Alabama. It was the occasion of the 40th an anniversary of the Bloody Sunday March, and myself and other LDF colleagues were there to march with other citizens, some who had been there 40 years ago, and others. And as we marched across the bridge, we came to, as, as you come down across the bridge, you come to a billboard, which is sort of on the right-hand side. So when you're taking that historic path of the march, the one that John Lewis and others took years ago, you come to see a billboard. And the billboard is advertising uh, the historic um, sites of the Confederacy. And it's a, there's a big Confederate flag up there. 
And I, I recently had occasion to speak to some Selma residents about that billboard. I sort of saw it from a distance, and so I thought that it was striking. You know, at, at this juncture, when we are talking about how far we've come, that the, one of the first billboards that you see when you come over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in 2007 is a Confederate flag that um, suggests that you should go see the historic sites of the Civil War in that um, uh, deeply African-American populated part of the state. And so I was told by these Selma residents that not only is that the image, but that there is a quote on there from Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate general who came to uh, hold a very prominent position in the Ku Klux Klan. And the quote that's up there is, keep the scare on them. Keep the scare on them is, is on that billboard. So when I see that billboard and when I, when I went to um, Selma for that march, again, it tells me this story. Yes, we've come far, but yes, I think we have a ways to go. So I, will, uh, I, I won't stop to talk too much about um, how Section 5 works. I think we've heard ably from uh, my colleagues about how it works. But I'm going to talk a little bit about two cases that I think show us where we are today in the context of Section 5, the important preclearance provision. And in so doing, I'm going to sort of violate my own rule. I spend a lot of time when I'm speaking about the Voting Rights Act uh, trying to explain to people that Section 5 is not just about redistricting. Redistricting is what gets written about. It's, it's, a, it's a very important aspect of the voting issues that Section 5 deals with and addresses. But Section 5, as, as we've heard from others, deals with a number of other changes that can have significant impact on voters' ability to participate in the political process. For example, if you cannot find the poll or get to the polls, you cannot vote. And so Section 5 um, deals with a lot of different methods of disfranchising voters. But having said that, I'm now going to violate the rule by talking about two redistricting cases. But I think when I do, you, you'll see why I think they're important at this juncture. First, they're both from the recent round of redistricting, the post-2000 census round. And the first is a case called Georgia v. Ashcroft which was decided by the Supreme Court. And that case raised the issue about whether or not uh, very small reductions in the percentages of African American voters within what we call a minority opportunity district, whether very small reductions in the minority percentage violates the Section 5 principle of no, no backsliding. Essentially, the legal standard, which we, we call retrogression, just means it's essentially a no worse off standard. You can't make the minority population worse off uh, with a voting change than they find themselves under the status quo. So in a way, although it applies broadly to a lot of jurisdictions, though only those with specific histories of discrimination, what it seeks to do is limited. It's not seeking to um, give any affirmative benefits or additional expansion of minority power. It's simply st um, trying to stop retrogressive um, uh, maneuvers and tactics, trying to stop the tendency, which is pervasive, and I would argue still pervasive, of targeting minority communities to turn back the clock. So in this case, what DOJ had to look at was whether these very small reductions in these minority opportunity districts constituted a, violu a violation of, of that principle. And what DOJ found was as to three districts, it was in fact a violation, the idea being that Sometimes when districts are, um, because of racially polarized voting, if you don't have a substantial concentration of minority voters, because voters tend to vote along race lines, those districts will not give an opportunity to minority candidates to elect candidates of choice. And the idea is that by protecting the um, percentage of minorities in the district, you can also protect the opportunity to elect a candidate of choice. Not necessarily to elect a minority candidate, but to elect that candidate that the minority community prefers. And when DOJ found that those, um, in the Section 5 process, found that those small reductions were problematic, um, ultimately there was a case that went to a three-judge panel. And the lower court had a very detailed and searching record and two judges found that indeed those small reductions mattered. They were in the zone where it mattered. And they would have an effect on the impact of minority voters to um, elect candidates of choice in those districts. And ultimately that case was appealed. The, what was happening, I should say, to give a little bit of the political but now it's also legal context, is that the reason that those districts were being reduced is, is because there was an idea that the um, National Democratic Party had been pursuing that because African Americans are the most reliable Democratic voters, the very important thing to do is to take African American voters and spread them out to other districts. 
essentially not to focus on whether or not there is a harm to the minority empowerment principle, but to focus on the partisan interest of protecting Democrats by calling upon African American voters to be the grist of partisan aspiration. Um, in fairness, I have to say that the record in Georgia v. Ashcroft uh, reveals that many of the elected officials, many of whom because of the Voting Rights Act are African American in Georgia, supported this approach. It was, it was their judgment that uh, because African Americans widely support uh, Democrats, that in this situation, it mattered so much, maintaining control of the, of the state legislature mattered so much that even if the opportunity of the people's opportunity to elect, which I want to distinguish from their likelihood of being reelected, right, because they're now incumbents, so they have the bully pulpit. So they, their view was that reducing the people's opportunity to elect another candidate of choice, if, pray tell, they decide that that incumbent is not handling the people's business, um, would be reduced. And they decided that that was okay in those circumstances. The Supreme Court got this case after the, after the district court said that that was a problematic uh, uh, retrogressive effect under, under uh, um, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act. The Supreme Court got the case and said, well, actually, the, the district court, notwithstanding the very detailed record that they assembled, notwithstanding the high extent of racially polarized voting post-2000, not in 1965, but post-2000, at every level of election, um, although it varied some from local races to more national races, as, as one might expect. The, the idea was that um, in, that, in that situation, the court needed to look more broadly to other notions of what, what constitutes minority empowerment. And they needed to consider a nebulous concept which they called influence, the idea that having the opportunity to elect candidates of choice may not be the touchstone, but instead um, having the ability to influence, whatever that means, may in some way make the minority community whole. And so they announced a new standard in which um, under Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, DOJ's job got a little bit tougher, but perhaps is not unadministerable because certainly there is some meaning as to when you have influence and when you don't. Uh, I'll stop and just say um, quickly, in a Louisiana case, we had similar issues, but a different political context. Again, there, they decided to reduce minority power, but there they just wanted to wipe out a minority majority district in Orleans Parish, notwithstanding that the African American population had increased, the white population had uh, decreased, and there they just decided that they wanted to wipe it out to protect incumbents, and they did wipe it out. And then they filed a case trying to justify it. And on the eve of trial, after they got some uh, stinging rulings from the three-judge panel, LDF was representing African-American voters in that case. Louisiana and, um, and their counsel decided to withdraw that plan, restore the African-American district, and, and settle the case. So those two cases are important because they show that there are a number of partisan considerations, incumbency protection considerations, and a variety of other considerations that bear on how power is going to be wielded in the political process. But in both situations, but for um, important statutes, there would have been a, a substantial erosion of political power. Of course, I would argue that the Supreme Court got it wrong in Georgia v. Ashcroft and that the outcome there uh, was not what we would have wanted. But the Louisiana case tells us that apart from the um, nature of the partisan fights, that come what may, whether it's partisan, whether it's about an incumb a particular incumbent, whatever it is, there is always going to be a tendency to um, reduce the power of those who have come most recently to share it. And I think that's a problem for us. And uh, perhaps we can talk more in the questions about the uh, further issues we face in the reauthorization. Thanks. Thank you, Debo. If you don't vote, you don't count. It's your turn to talk, Veronica. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to um, say that as a, as a Korean American who immigrated here at the age of eight, uh, and uh, having grown up as a language minority, uh, the spirit of this lecture series is very close to my heart. So uh, thank you um, to the Ackerman family for creating this uh, opportunity and this forum. Uh, I just came back from D.C. last week where there was a conference of about uh, 200 community activists from across the country speaking on electoral politics and organizing. And uh, there was a point at which um, one of the, uh, the civil rights leaders um, invited us to stand up on our chairs. And, and the point of that exercise was to remind us that in our work to, to bring progress um, in civil rights, 
that it's really important for us to put ourselves in the context of history um, and to understand where, we're, where, where we've been, but to also take those lessons and to try to become better strategists and, and, and try to change our perspective about how we see the problem so that we can best serve our communities. And I bring that up because um, we've, you've heard from many speakers here today, um, from all the lawyers here, uh, of, of the many legal um, and the, the, the legislative uh, pieces of the Voting Rights Act um, and the, the history of disenfranchisement uh, that that act was um, geared to address. Uh, as an Asian American um, and, and as an organizer in New York City, uh, what I see is that we stand on the shoulders um, of this long history in, in America of, uh, of exclusion at the polls. I mean, just to give a uh, just the context, I mean, it was in 1882 that Congress passed the Chinese Exclusion Act denying voting rights and citizenship, uh, citizenship rights to Chinese Americans. And it took over 60 years um, for Congress to repeal that act. Um, so it wasn't until 1943 that that act was uh, repealed, giving Asian uh, uh, Chinese uh, Americans the right to participate um, as full citizens. So when we talk about this history uh, of how um, disenfranchisement has affected um, various communities of color, I think it's so crucial for us to really see it as, um, as a racial issue that continues to plague us. And, and, and uh, in the introduction, we talked about how it, we wanted to make sure that democracy um, fights were being uh, waged not only abroad, but here in, uh, in the States. And so I really wanted to just um, echo that. Uh, what I'd like to focus on um, is are two pieces of the, the special provisions, as they call it, of the Voting Rights Act that impact um, not only the Asian American community, but also the Latino community and other communities of color. Uh, mainly, uh, as you've heard, Section 203, which uh, provides language assistance to language minorities, including uh, languages like Spanish, uh, well, Native American languages, um, and uh, Chinese and Korean, and, and so on. And then the other piece, uh, which is, um, as you know, it's Section 6.9, which um, requires that there be a federal monitors um, at elections to make sure that if there's any funny business, that there is um, someone from the DOJ to make sure that uh, those issues are addressed um, in, an, in a very effective manner. Uh, there are certain mechanical pieces of 203 that haven't yet been mentioned, and I think it's important for us to at least um, be, ab be abreast on this, which is that uh, this the special provision um, requires bilingual assistance for a language minority group um, if certain conditions are met. And I think I believe most of you already know this, but um, this, the first condition is that if that language minority in a certain jurisdiction co um, comprises over 5% um, of the, uh, the at-large voting age population, that being 18 years and above, um, or if that language minority uh, population is over 10,000 um, people in that certain jurisdiction. In addition to that either or uh, condition, there's a second prong, which is that uh, the literacy rate of the citizens in that language uh, minority community has got to be higher than the national illiteracy rate. And that Ill illiteracy rate is defined as um, failure to graduate from of the fifth grade education in primary school. So, I mean, it, it begs the question, um, you know, that why is a language minority population being, you know, being held up to a higher standard of literacy than the, than the at-large population to be able to receive protection? And I also think it begs the question that I think that um, I think it's fair enough to, to ask, uh, do these language protections invite uh, cultural division, uh, you know, by maybe not, I mean, we've heard this argument before, you know, why uh, is it the citizens of, of different communities um, still need language assistance, why, why don't they just take English classes and, and get up to speed so that they're able to just read a, a ballot or, or just register the, the regular way? Um, and I would argue the opposite, that actually, um, that by providing language assistance, you're actually making it easier for those folks in, in the communities, in the Asian and the Latino community, to, to participate fully in the American civic process. And I can tell you that from the grounds up, um, having um, seen the level of excitement uh, that our community uh, expressed and mobilized around in the last elections, um, with taxi driver associations organizing carpools to make sure that people who were too either sick or t living too far away from the polls got to the polls, um, that people are very um, excited about 
you know, exercising their American right to participate in the, the, the electoral process. And I think that needs to be said because in, in the midst of all these legal discussions, it, we sometimes forget the, the real life impact that these protections have in our communities. Um, and, you know, I think the other uh, misconception that I believe was aptly um, um, corrected by uh, Commissioner Kellner earlier was that uh, despite this belief that um, that the costs associated with providing uh, language assistance may be high. In fact, um, those states that um, are required by federal mandate to provide that assistance, you actually find that the, the added cost is only a small percentage of the total electoral um, administration costs. So that I think that correction needs to be put out there so that we, we know what facts we're dealing with. Um, We've talked about the, racial, the history of racial exclusion. We've also heard from many colleagues here about um, the extreme case, you know, where you're seeing crosses on your front yard, um, a, a very blatant, um, perhaps not so blatant systemic ways to exclude uh, you know, minority uh, candidates of color. Um, but I think um, in the spirit of trying to nuance ourselves and looking forward to the future, um, we have to recognize that um, the power of the vote and the, the effect of exclusion, exclusion from the polls whether it's intended or um, effective, um, is that you're actually depriving that disenfranchised voter of um, casting a vote on issues um, that affect their community. And in particular, uh, one point that we make over and over again to our immigrant communities in mobilizing the vote, um, uh, uh, especially in the last elections and of course in the upcoming local elections, is the, the tremendous power of that one single vote to be able to, to raise a voice on behalf of your community for vital resources such as education, um, health care, and, and fair housing, and so on. And so um, I think that also leads me into uh, correcting another misconception, is, which is that um, oftentimes it's believed that voters of non-native um, backgrounds have certain special interests that they're trying to um, you know, uh, mobilize at the poll you know, behind these closed curtains. And, Research would actually have you um, tell the opposite. Um, Professor Minetti uh, of, 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 of University uh, Columbia uh, Barnard has done significant studies that show that, in fact, non-native voters um, have shown that they care about the same very issues that, quote, native um, voters care about. Those being, you know, where their kids are going to school, um, you know, how safe are their streets, what, what housing um, is available. And so this is just part of the American story that, you know, when we talk about the importance of making sure that in, two, that in um, August of 2007, um, that we make sure that these provisions are reauthorized, um, when we imagine a world where that does not happen, or we imagine a world where perhaps even uh, realistically speaking, as has been alluded, maybe Congress would reauthorize, but then it's you know, subject to, um, to challenge at the Supreme Court level. We need to be really um, conscious about what impact that would have on our communities. And so, uh, so I put that out there. Um, we, I also would like to address uh, uh, the fact that even though we've said that places like New York have been mandated by the Voting Rights Act to provide assistance, in fact, um, there are certain areas in which, because of these requirements, um, we're finding that, uh, that people are being uh, effectively disenfranchised. Uh, for instance, I mean, just to give a real-life example, in Queens, you know, you've got uh, you've got Spanish, Chinese, and, and Korean being mandated, but then there are certain areas like the Bronx or, or Brooklyn, um, or say even Suffolk County or Westchester, where there are certain language minority groups are, are not yet, haven't yet met the, you know, the, uh, the standard to be able to receive that language assistance, whether it's um, verbal or written um, or at the polls. So, uh, for instance, Bronx, you've, you've still only got Spanish. Um, in, in Nassau and Suffolk, also just Spanish. Westchester, Spanish. Um, New Jersey, uh, Massachusetts. Um, you know, at this time, I actually would like to acknowledge that there is a, um, a, a colleague that I value very much uh, from the Asian community, from the Asian American Legal Defense Fund, uh, Glenn McBantai, the staff attorney there. And, um, <laughs> hi, Glenn. And, you know, and I know that one thing that we discuss is the, the importance um, for our communities to try to figure out uh, methodologies that would be able to capture, um, you know, rising populations like the Koreans in New Jersey, um, and uh, also in Massachusetts, you know, groups like the Cambodians, the Vietnamese, and the Chinese who are currently not covered, but you know, who um, are significant enough that they do require that assistance. Um, and 
you know, before moving on to the federal monitoring piece, um, I, I just really wanted to say that this is not a, a this should not be a dis divisive point where uh, because it's only affecting, say, certain communities like the Latino or the Asian community um, and the Native American community, that it's seen as somehow not less important as the other provisions. In fact, uh, the argument that I want to make here tonight is that when we do this coalition building to make sure that that, um, that these pro th these special protections uh, are reauthorized in 2007, that we start to think re um, really more creatively about how it is that we can uh, take into account all the different needs of the various communities of color and the different immigrant communities. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the, the Russian community is one such community uh, that is uh, that perhaps you know uh, is thinking about ways to gain extra protections at the polls. So this, we really have to think of this as, a, as an American a problem um, and put it in the, firmly in the history of the racial, um, racially best based exclusions um, that have taken place over time. And I think once we do that, we can start to put our minds together regardless of what fields we're coming at this from, whether it be the law or the community organizing perspective, um, to really try to think about how, it, you know, how we can include the community folks at these discussions when we, when we try to mobilize and really think strategically and come up with counter arguments to those arguments that are sure to attack us um, you know, closer to 2007. And you know, at this point, I also wanted to just um, let you know that, um, very concretely speaking, because I was invited here to give a, a more of a grassroots perspective to this, is that um, you know, when we form things like APAVA, the Asian Pacific American Voters Alliance, it's 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 really precisely because we recognize that there are just too few of us, and also just there are few two resources for us um, to mobilize, um, that we recognize that we just had to band all those 40 groups, you know, each of whom are literally speaking, volunteer folks that are working on top of a 40, 50 hour um, a day weeks to make sure that come election time uh, that public officials are listening to our collective voice to make sure that um, you know, we are going to hold them accountable to their policies. And the second piece of it is that um, as, as part of this collective effort, we've tried our best to be present at hearings um, you know, by the Board of Elections of New York City, um, by the Voter Assistance Commission, to hold them to task when they make such arguments, <coughs> such as, and this was the most recent argument that I heard at the last VAC meeting, um, is that you know, uh, there are so many things that we've got to do to get our electoral house in gear in New York only if we had the funds um, at our disposal. And isn't it too bad that the public officials out in Albany or in New York, um, New York City just don't see this as a priority? And my response was, you know what, that's not good enough because then you're putting it on, our, on the shoulders of our community to basically come up with ways to fix the system that's clearly um, needs fixing. And so when you've got folks um, at the, you know, the elected officials, making those kinds of arguments um, to community members who often don't know better, uh, you know, I think it really in raises for me, in my mind, the, the importance of community advocates to really um, flip the argument back on them because it's, we're not fools here. We know that on, the, on those kinds of boards and on the, on the commission sit very experienced um, elected president um, and past elected officials who do have the connections to the political system and who do know about the discretionary funding to, to, to divert and, you know, and to, to redirect funding to make sure that certain priorities are met. So, and, and, what we, and the reason we make sure we um, go to these hearings is because these things get put on um, public record. And so uh, I guess the point I'm making um, is that when we do the SWAT uh, team monitoring on, uh, you know, on November 2004, and you know, with just a crew of one law student and myself um, going around all the poll sites in, in Queens, because Korean is a language that I know, uh, to make sure that, uh, that poll workers are, make, are trained properly and aren't turning people away, um, to me, this is just the beginning of a story and, and the beginning of a long, long struggle that we have to engage in to make sure that our collective communities are protected. And I think I wanted to end with a, a very brief story because stories are very important to make sure that, um, that we keep 
I think the, our purpose real. And um, on election day, there was a, a family of five Korean Americans who called into our hotline um, at about 11 o'clock in the morning. They had gone to the poll site where they uh, voted for the past few elections. And uh, for whatever reason, they have been turned away. Um, they were told that they were at the, ro the wrong poll site. And, um, and given a slip of paper to go to a, another church nearby. They went there and then they were told that they, that too was not a proper place for them to, to vote. So uh, long story short, it took um, until about 30 minutes before closing time, the, the poll sites closed. Um, we had to basically meet the family out there. Uh, mind you, uh, three out, four out of the five um, couldn't get out of work. So they, you know, unfortunately had effectively been, you know, been taken away their vote. But the one grandpa um, that, you know, God bless him, he, he showed up with his little granddaughter and uh, stood there while I ar basically got into an argument with a poll worker and then um, uh, asked to see the books because they claimed that his name was just not on the books. And lo and behold, guess what? His, his entire family had been on, on that uh, role that whole day. And for whatever reason, the poll worker the poll worker had just misdirected this person. And, it, and even with the advocacy, advocacy skills that our team brought to bear, it took about a good 30 minutes. And even with the DOJ um, monitors standing right nearby, it took over 30 minutes for us to get that one man to, to cast his vote in, in, in his neighborhood. So that's just one example of the, the importance uh, of, of this kind of monitoring activity and, and the reason why if we find ourselves in, you know, close to 2006 without any real nuanced and real high-level strategic planning to make sure this gets passed and, and in a way that's um, immune from uh, Supreme Court challenge, that we're doing our communities a huge disservice. And in the spirit of changing our perspective and uh, looking to history, but also to learn, to nuance ourselves better, I invite all of you to um, think creatively with groups like ours to make sure that when we have national discussions of how to formulate the strategies that um, the voices of the community are included in those dialogues. Thank you very much. Well, we want to give you a chance to talk to this wonderful brain trust, so I invite you to the microphone but I also ask for no speeches, just questions, so we can get through as many people as possible. Could you identify yourself, sir? Andy Hum, uh, you all do tremendous work just to get people access, to get people to the, to the, you know, to the starting line. But of course, for a lot of Americans, they get to the, you know, they, we've always had the right to vote, and we could care less because uh, the system is broken. Uh, things don't change. Incumbents get reelected all the time, and people just drop out. So what I'm asking is. Uh, since you're so concerned about voting issues, are there any major voting reforms, uh, election reforms in this country that you are enthusiastic about that would change the system to get all people excited about voting? And I, you know, not to put any weight on these, but you know, things like proportional representation, instant runoff voting, and non-political redistricting, complete non-political redistricting. Do any of these, are, are they on your agenda for the future? Are any of you united around any of these? Nina? Well, I'm not going to give you a broad answer, but a narrow one. There is no such thing as non-political redistricting. <laughs> Even if it's purported to be done by nonpartisan people, they are always partisan people. And even when it's purported to be done by commissions that are supposed to be balanced, <clears throat> that are appointed, or whether it's, you know, the California proposal for a few minutes was to have f former federal judges, you can't take the politics out of redistricting. It in thoroughly infects and diseases the process and uh, having been involved in redistricting that was both done by a legislature as well as two commission type bodies I can tell you it, it it didn't reduce the amount of litigation that ensued by the party that felt that it had been wronged and it also didn't reduce the amount of accusation flying back and <coughs> forth between the two major parties about who had rigged or who was the independent who was really the, the wolf in sheep's clothing and so I, I haven't yet seen the redistricting body that can do this without politics in it. I, I think it's a great question. And, and I guess I would respond by saying that the, this forum focused on the Voting Rights Act and the importance of that particular uh, legislation as a tool to enhance access for groups that have been excluded. There are also a set of election reforms. And Commissioner Kellner talked about the Help America Vote Act, the 
uh, national motor voter bill, laws that really did help to open up the system, both for access, but also to encourage voters to uh, participate in the polls. Hillary Clinton has a great bill that's been introduced that has additional reforms, including felon disfranchisement relief that would be enacted into law. It would also address you know, some of the problems that the Help America Vote Act didn't respond to. And there are a whole set of issues that then are in a third category that need to be addressed. For example, there are problems with um, state election officials like secretaries of state who have responsibility to uh, monitor um, you know, the election system but are also partisan supporters in favor of one candidate or another. At some point, we've got to address that. I mean, Ken Blackwell, the Secretary of State of Ohio, was, of course, head of the President uh, Bush re-election campaign, just as one example, and this is not intended to be partisan, just to give you a little heads up. Now, there's a third category, <coughs> which go to the issues that you're talking about, which are how do you get people to come to the polls when you have a 40% um, you know, non-participation rate? Same day registration, uh, trying to encourage people to be given the day off, a paid holiday for people who vote. You know, the UAW negotiated the contract, their last contract in Michigan, required UAW workers to get the day off to go to the polls. Made a dramatic difference in their participation and the level of the outcome. <laughs> Ms. Young talked about the Korean family who didn't get a chance to vote. Four members had to go to work. They couldn't get off that day. They were effectively disfranchised. So, I mean, there are a whole host of these kinds of good government reforms that we need to look at. Uh, but the truth is that those are going to be very hard to put into effect. And there does have to be a sort of prioritization of what you think are the most important pieces of the puzzle regarding the constituencies you are most concerned about. And if the issue for us right now is gaining access to the political system and ensuring that our vote is cast and given some equivalent weight, while we also have concern about those generic elements that help to improve voter turnout, we're going to have to decide where we put our emphasis and concern. So yes, we are concerned about that. Yes, we work with groups that are trying to make that happen. But that is not you know, the primary focus right now for us. Well, I think you can see from our panel here tonight that vigilance over voting rights is still needed, um, that to make these reforms meaningful, we need leadership, we need lawsuits, and we need legislation. And you've heard a little bit about each of those here tonight. And as a final note, I'd like to read uh, in closing a quote from President Johnson uh, when he uh, submitted the legislation, the Voting Rights Act, originally to Congress, and that will close our program for tonight. But even if we pass this bill, the battle will not be over. What happened in Selma is part of a far larger movement which reaches into every section and state of America. It is the effort of American Negroes to secure for themselves the full blessings of American life. Their cause must be our cause too, because it is not just Negroes, but it is really all of us who must overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. And we shall overcome. Thank you.